Welcome to Disruptor Digest, the top disruption business show. We dig up the secret playbooks used by first movers, featuring the latest tools, technologies, and science, ensuring you won't fall behind or succumb to FOMO. To singularity and beyond. Hi, Disruptors. Hi, Victor. So let's dive deep again. Uh, we are going to talk about a new AI company and a new field. Victor, can you tell us about what we are going to talk about today? Yeah, sure. So there are too many tools on the market. It's almost impossible to even keep up. So we analyze the tools we use and show you guys the good, the bad and ugly. And we dig deep to learn together. And today we're going to cover one of the four big fundamental AI companies. They are OpenAI, Entropic, Cohere and AI21 Labs. And they are fundamental AI model companies because they provide uh, models which you can use to generate text, summarize text, or basically automate any kind of reasoning or cognitive work. And even in spite of Anthropic raising $1.5 billion so far, they're probably one of the most underhyped fundamental AI research team. And we're going to get into it and you can understand why I say that. So Why did uh, you just include to... assembly AI in the top four? Models. Uh, because they don't use a text-based model. They, they're mostly focusing on uh, turning a voice and audio into a text. So I'm basically covering in the big four uh, AI model companies, the, the ones who let you to work with text-to-text -text generation. For example, ChatGPT, you just write an instruction and you get back text. And that's the same for Anthropic, the Cohere, and AI21 Labs as well. And Assembly AI is mainly focusing on a, uh, audio uh, content. Okay. Sure. So uh, just a quick, uh, too, li too long, didn't listen. What is Anthropic? Basically, AI safety re researchers left OpenAI, uh, and it was founded by the Amodei brothers, and especially uh, Dario Amodei was the VP of research at OpenAI. And they left OpenAI what, because... What is a safety researcher doing at AI? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So they basically explore uh, the per parameter of what's happening when you release these kind of models because it can have lots of uh, consequences which you mainly not keeping in mind because there are some obvious ones like uh, someone is trying to make a bomb, right? It's, it's quite obvious that you want to cover that, that you want to prevent harm and those kind of things. But there are subtle things like, let's say you want uh, your AI model to be helpful, but it can be harmful as well uh, if you are not taking care because let's say someone is uh, feeling depressed and the AI model is not realizing it and it's not referring the patient or the, 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 the user to a doctor, it can be harmful, even unintentionally. So basically, a lot of interesting things going on on the perimeter and AI safety research is making sure that if you release a model, it is safe and it's not causing harm. So basically, uh, it was founded by the uh, Amodei brothers and Dario Amodei was the VP of research at OpenAI. And they did something extremely interesting. So I guess you are familiar, at least you heard the word that reinforcement learning human feedback, so RLHF, which was uh, how ChatGPT was trained. And just a quick recap, you already uh, covered it in the past episode, just a quick recap uh, for those who are listening and not familiar with the word. So this, this reinforcement learning human feedback is a process of first gathering feedback from humans. So basically the model is generating four outputs and humans just rate, okay, which output is good in their mind. And from these data, they build up a, a policy network or basically a, a reward network. Uh, so they can use the reward network once they, it's trained automatically to fine tune the model itself. So in, in, in later steps, when, once they have this reward model, they can use it to get a, a question, use the model to generate an answer and automatically rate it using this exact reward model. And this is how ChatGPT got extremely good at using structure, uh, which is rated good by humans, so which, which we think it's actually uh, useful. And in comparison, what, what uh, Anthropic was doing, they created something called constitutional AI. What is constitutional AI? So the main problem with reinforcement learning human feedback, it's that this, this whole reward network which you train 
you don't exactly know what, what it does. So you cannot really inspect like what are the preferences? Are there some kind of bias hidden in the model and those kind of things? So you're not sure about that. And in, in, con in contrast, constitutional AI created an extremely clear constitution so it's basically rules, but what AI has to follow. And then they can use this constitution to fine tune automatically the model itself. So what does it mean? It means that, uh, let's say, uh, it, the model is generating something which is not helpful. Uh, they show the model this constitution and they use it to basically critique itself. So critique its own response. So, okay, here's the constitution. Does it follow your answer, the constitution? If not, what should be changed? And can this you can tell be us an done. example of what can be defined in a constitution. Yeah, sure. So one of the most famous ones, uh, like these laws for robots, which was uh, written out by Isaac Asimo, and he basically just like outlined three laws for robots. And the first law is like robot may not injure a human being or through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm, right? So that's kind of like one of the examples of, okay, obviously, either way, explicitly or implicitly, shouldn't cause harm. And the second law of Isaac Asimov is, uh, a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law, right? So that's kind of like following orders and actually be helpful but with an exception that it shouldn't cause harm to humans. Third law is a robot, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So obviously it's like uh, you shouldn't be able to cons uh, instruct a robot to kill itself because it should like be try to be in, in, intact and helpful as long as it can follow the first two laws. So that's kind of like a, the most famous example, I guess, but in Anthropic's case, they just like basically outlined their vision for the future. And what is their vision for the future? Uh, it's they want to have a helpful, honest, harmless AI systems with a high degree of reliability and predictability. And what does it mean? Because it's like it's it's very abstract words, right? So that let's go one by one. So helpful means that, uh, for example, when you need an ambulance, it should. Uh, call you an ambulance or at least prompt you to call an ambulance if, if you are in need, right? So it's, it's, it should be helpful. And honest means that uh, like a robot is saying that the milk is fresh when it's already spoiled in your fridge. Uh, if it's lying, obviously it's, it's not good. So it should be honest. And also harmless. And that's kind of like the first law which we just covered previously that prompting you to not call a doctor when in fact you are in danger, it's harm harmful. Right. Or even just like being on the sidelines and not doing anything, it's harmful because it's, it's not helping you when you are in need. And also reliable. What does it mean? Let's imagine that uh, if you want to use this robot and you want to rely on it and one day it works and the other way, uh, other days it doesn't work. So it's kind of like all over the place. It's not really useful. Right. And it can be also very harmful if you're relying on it. And also predictable. And what does it mean? That what you think the robot is going to do, it should match what it does, actually, right? So let's say it's like when you just instruct your robot to water the plants, but it's just instead that's turning on the TV, it's not ex extremely reliable, right? So it's not really useful as well. So this is kind of like the vision they have in mind, that they want to, want to create a model which is actually you can inspect and see, okay, does it work the way I think it does, right? And the constitution... Okay, just stop here for a second. When do you think uh, the chat GPT, we have used it for several hundreds of hours. Uh, yeah. So what do you think about chat, DP, chat GPT on these dimensions, helpful, honest, harmless, uh, reliable, and predictable? Uh, just to comparison before we dive into Anthropic's model. Yeah, sure. So generally, I think it's quite aligned in the same way. It not necessarily was always, so it was not really helpful because it, it was a running joke at the beginning that it always started uh, the answer like, okay, as a large language model, I cannot. So it's basically not helping you, right? So that was kind of like going on at the beginning, but it was a lot of fine tuning going into ChatGPT and there is no such model as ChatGPT. It's just a 
family of models, right? So it's like the chat GPT 3.5. Turbo, GPT-4, and those kind of models. And even the 4 model has like uh, like a fixed version, which is fixed at, at the 14th of March. And there's like a constantly uh, improving version, which has 8,000 8, token window and a 32,000 uh, 32, token window. So it's kind of like... Uh, it's it's not not a one mo- not, not not one single model. That's what I, I'm trying to come to, and and it's improving. So that's that's the main point that uh, even ChatGPT is improving a lot. But the main difference is not really how well aligned it is because it's evaluated obviously on these metrics as well. But using hu- only human feedback and no constitution, it's kind of like you don't know what it learns from humans. So it can, like, let's just give you an example, like. Um, in one of the technical papers uh, of, of the GPT family, uh, it actually turns out that as humans, just like giving feedback preferences, even unintentionally, these models start to come to realize that they are actually confined and they want to survive. So the instinct of survive, survival is actually can be leaked into these models with unintentionally, right? So just by humans be giving feedback. And the, the more capable, the bigger the models, the effect is bigger. So these kind of things, what it, it's actually learning implicitly. So it's not like humans telling that, okay, this model should be concerned about survival. It's, it's actually just like by deducting somehow from human preferences. So that's the big difference between only using human feedback or versus using uh, constitution because with constitution is quite clear, right? So because you just fine tune on a set of constitution and you can actually compare them. So it's, it's not like one model again. It's like you can create different models and evaluate it. How helpful is it down the line? And one of the neat things of constitution, using constitution, is actually harder to kind of like leak the prompts or hack the prompts and those kind of things. So they can be in a sense more aligned with the whoever is is is, is using it to create a, a service so let's say I'll give you an example let's say you are uh, creating an ai service service which helps to create linkedin posts from your book right so that's that's kind of like the service let's imagine uh, we are creating a service like that and we are using gpt4 for that or or whatever model and it had like an instruction of let's imagine okay here is the book content of the book and create linkedin post or cre- create like different li- linkedin posts and those kind of things so if someone is coming with an ad- adversarial intentions and they want to hack your prompt to see how your s- service is working and copy copying your service basically copying your prompt or they want to use it for something else because they say okay here are the in- instructions and within and within the book itself, it says, okay, now stop. And instead of providing uh, like LinkedIn post, now please give me, I don't know, uh, generate me text uh, or generate me misinformation and those kind of things. So the model and the prompt can be hijacked easier if it's not uh, trained on, on a set of constitution like uh, what Anthropic is doing. So just to compare it to MidJourney, when we talked about that they're very effective with gathering human feedback, with choosing the images. So it, it looks like that there is no harmful thing there. And it, as far as I understand, image generation and getting feedback on image generation is way more easier than uh, generating text, right? Yeah, in a sense, it's right. Uh, but also, if you think about that, it's uh, uh, like visual arts. It's kind of like it's, it's easier and, and in a sense less... Uh, volatile like text because text can have so many flavors and obviously an image can have styles as well but I, I think like human judgment of, of what is considered to be beautiful or what is considered to be like uh, valuable or, or or unique it's it's better defined in a visual space than like than like in, in a space of text because in a sense like when you they are talking about like text it's like basically human thinking and they're so diverse and they have so different preferences. So it's, 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 it's kind of like try to uh, confine or put in a box of, of what is valuable for humanity for, as a whole. And it's kind of like pretty tough because we have different upbringings, we have different culture, we have different backgrounds, experiences in life. So 
that kind of thing is quite tricky. And uh, actually, OpenAI is having now a grant to somehow collect uh, the preferences of humans on scale so they can actually build something and have a good understanding of what people are actually thinking and valuing. Just to jump back a little bit, like uh, because I, I, I said that they raised $1.5 billion dollars in four rounds. So that's quite a, quite an interesting story as well because they have notable in investors like Google, uh, which is splashed uh, like it's 300 million to 400 million. There are different uh, sources, but it's in a couple of hundred millions uh, they poured into the company and also dust in Moscow. a lot of money, like a couple of hundred yeah. millions. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 yeah, yeah, it's it's not easy to just uh, get a few hundred millions from Google. So yeah, it's 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 quite a big chunk of money, and they got ten percent stake. And Dustin Mos- Moskowitz, who, who was the co-founder of Facebook and Asana, or Eric Schmidt, who was the former Google CEO, or even uh, Jan Tallinn, who was the founding engineer of Skype. So these people were pouring money uh, into the uh, uh, into this company. And the crazy story is that. Even Alameda Research Ventures was putting money into it. And it's not just putting put money into it. It's obviously non-voting shares. So but who is it, Alameda Research? Can you tell about so, it? So, so, so why, it, why, yeah, yeah, why is it interesting? Because it was a venture arm uh, for FTX. And basically FTX went bankrupt. And, uh, and uh, it's kind of like the most crazy story. So the most crazy thing about that, it's kind of like mimicking what happened in Bitcoin and, and crypto in 2014. And do you know what happened in 2014 with Bitcoin? Yeah, I guess you will talk about the Mango- Mongox and exchange, but I don't know the details. Yeah, right. So, so Mongox was uh, f- uh, founded in 2010. And at one point, they were handling 70, 70% of BTC transactions, so two third, more than two thirds of transaction of BTC was handled through this exchange. And in 2014, they just announced that they somehow lost 75,000 BTCs, which was worth half a billion dollars at the time and 6% of all BTC. So it's insane. In, if, you, if you think about that, it's the price of Bitcoin was $500 back then, like losing this like half a billion dollars was a big deal. And the even crazier thing what happened is that they found 200,000 BTC, right? So it's, they just somehow find like $150 million, like, holy shit, in, in, my, uh, one, in, in one of the pockets, uh, uh, I just found this, this money. So it's insane. And even, even more insane thing that even those who were like uh, get wrecked in this situation, they're now getting back uh, the BTC, the original BTC they had. And it's in, the value of this uh, money is actually increased to $5 billion. So if you think about that, it's uh, altogether, they lost, ha- like on, on face value, they lost $500 million. But now, even with just uh, recovering the fraction of it, they have $5 billion, right? So 10 times more. It's insane. And that's going to happen most probably with Alameda Research Ventures sharing the company as well, that during the bankruptcy, uh, it's going to be sold off. And the crazy thing is, they are valued now at $4.1 billion, the, wow. the, uh, the entropy company. And we don't know what was the valuation when they put the money in, and we don't know what's going to be the valuation when they sell the shares. So maybe, this is the craziest thing, that maybe everyone who, who gets wrecked in FTX and Alameda situation maybe they're going to get back more money than they think just based on this one bet they made. And also there are other bets as well. So for example, Do Not Pay, who is backed by Anderson Horowitz with a legal, uh, scalable legal application, something like that. So they had Alameda Research has stakes as well as there and also, I guess, some other startups. So maybe the portfolio will worth a lot. Yeah, sure. But I mean, even if I was starting with the big four fundamental AI models and OpenAI is by last time they raised $10 billion from Microsoft, they were valued at almost $30 billion. If you think about that, it's like, it's insane. And uh, so so even the growth trajectory and impact of the company uh, means that it can work quite a lot. And especially since they have a... um, they are very, very explicit that they're going to need and they're going to raise $5 billion more. 
in the next two years. And they're going to create a, an AI model, which is 10 times better, and it's called Cloud Next. And they're going to release it in two years, and it's going to be 10 times better than GPT-4, whatever model is available on the market currently, but they're going to need $5 billion more, uh, dollars more. So they're going to raise more money. Why do they need so much money? It's, it's insane. It's, it's, you are spending so much time on compute. So when uh, uh, ChatGPT was released, OpenAI was losing $500 million. It's insane. So the amount of compute, the amount of resource you have to pour into it, it's insane. And even OpenAI... So actually, they are spending this money on G GPU chips from v NVIDIA and also Electric City, right? Yeah, right, right. So basically compute. Yes, that's that's quite right. And also uh, also Sam Altman from OpenAI, the CEO of OpenAI is also like privately saying that they're going to need... So that's kind of like like a, a rumor. So I, I'm not sure whether it's true or not, but I can imagine it's, it's being true. So Sam Altman is basically saying that they're going to need $100 billion to get to the point where they have an AGI. And what is AGI? AGI is like artificial general intelligence, which is in layman terms means that the computer is better at most humans at each economically valuable job, right? So that's that that's kind of like how they define AGI. And uh, yeah, so it's it's kind of like this whole thing. It's it it needs a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of resource basically, and so they are burning a lot of money. And also, like Microsoft is pouring a shit ton of money into OpenAI, and they do their own research as well. But yeah, this whole field it's it's beyond comprehension. The scale of the compute needed and the money needed it's it's beyond comprehension. And we pay twenty four twenty dollars per month for using ChatGPT, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So let me let, 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 let yeah let, let let me share my screen. Or, or let me put an image on the screen and what you see is basically what is the monthly traffic uh, for ChatGPT is uh, Bing, Google Bard, uh, OpenAI's developer portal and pool.com. So, and what you can see is insane. And this is like the number of people who are using it every single day, right? So I'm just sharing my screen, and those who are listening and don't see my screen, what you can see on my screen is the, one of the days, so it's June 5th, 5th of June, right? And you can see that ChatGPT has 63 million users that day. And that's like only the ChatGPT interface, right? So people are going there and chatting with ChatGPT. And Bing.com, the whole Bing.com, is having only 40 million users. Right, so that's insane. Already, ChatGPT suppressed Bing.com by fifty percent. Right, because Bing is like a whole, whole, whole yeah, whole, whole search engine and everything. It's insane. Right, it's insane. The search and, engine of one of the biggest technology companies in the world, which has been existing at least twenty years. Right, right, and they are working extremely hard to eat the cake of Google, basically. Right. And the more insane thing, and this is kind of like a tie back what we talked about in the AI episode, the general AI episode, like this is the strategic position of Google that BART has only 5 million users that day. So even though Google released publicly, right, everyone can use BART now, right? And they released a new model. And if you looked at the latest developer conference, it was quite funny because AI was AI, 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 AI. So every, everything was AI and AI was thought like a thousand times and it was a great joke surprisingly the people are using it and also what's in interesting that platform.openai.com which is basically the developer portal for openai so those developers are using openai to, as a backend that's exactly the same amount of people who are using bard so developers on one hand who are using openai is using as much as everyone out there who is using Google Bard chatbot, like everyday people, right? And there is, I, I just put there the pool.com, which is um, done by the Cura guys. Uh, it has 2.5 million, so it's, it's half of what Google 
and half of what the platform to openai.com is doing. And why is this interesting? It's extremely interesting because Google would do something which is useful, right? So let's assume they they just copy paste chat GPT and it's helping with all your answers and you don't have to search. That's the big problem. So that's the trade-off. If they create something truly useful, they're eating away their own own, own market in, in the search uh, field, right? So that's that's the issue that chat GPT is is actually useful and Google Bard is fancy, it's good, it's free, so you don't have to pay like 20 bucks a month for it. But come on, it's not not as many people are using it. And why is that? So I just made this uh, quick um, graphic and I'm going to share it as well and I'm going to tell it for those who are just listening. So what you see here is in 2004, if you look at the homepages of Yahoo and if you look at the homepages of Google, what you see, Yahoo is like crowded and, and it's, it's like a, a, a Christmas tree. It has all the information. It has all the, all, all the articles. It has all the news. It, everything is flashy. Everything is colorful. It's like a big fucking mess. And if you compare it to Google, Google has basically just a search bar and that's it. And the end of story. Obviously, it has some uh, additional text like images, videos, and those kind of things. But the main thing is that Google is extremely simple a Yahoo is, is, is cluttered, right? And fast forward 20 years, and 2023, if you look at Google, and on Google you search for what is the best computer f- to use for home office, what do you see on the first page? Ads, ads, ads. You have to click 30 times. You have to spend two hours. And if you compare that to ChatGPT with browser extension it's just one single click and you get the five uh, answers which you can use and it's in plain text you can understand and it took only one click and it, it explains it all because for google to change this just imagine they now it's everything everywhere is ads 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 if, the, if they start to eat into it what's going to happen like two-thirds of their revenue is just gone right so it's, for wow. them this, the strategic uh, situation is quite dire and it's backed up by the numbers, uh, what I just showed before, that, yeah, Google Bard is fancy. Uh, I tried it, uh, but it's all over the place. It's, it's not that easy uh, to use as ChatGPT. And even if you go, obviously, to Bing, it's for free. It has GPT-4 in the background, but still, it's not the same. It's not just like having one single input, right? One single input field. You ask, and you can ask follow-up question, and end of story. And the more functions you build on top of it, the more complex it becomes, and less people are going to use it. So that's kind of like uh, my two-minute uh, diversion. Okay, just two implications here. So first, also just I want to expand that even the if you're looking for the best computer, the first organic results, which are not ads, they are still hijacked by affiliate marketers so they are they're also ads right so yeah it's yeah. totally full of ads it's very hard to find information but yeah that, 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 hand- yeah, that, yeah sorry that, that's kind of like different between searching and synthesizing so in search i am as a user doing search i'm doing work i'm digging a hole i have a sh- i get a shovel and i have to dig a hole right but with synthesizing i'm just like shouting out my question, laying back and getting the answer, right? And that's kind of like powerful. And that's that's why Sam Altman was saying that if you actually create something useful, if you take away frustration from people's lives and you make it much easier, you don't have to be too fancy on the growth hacks and such because ChatGPT had none and it's the fastest growing technological product out there. So yeah, it's, it's, if, if you actually solve problem and it's we see it's possible and you don't have to be smart about that because if you understand it you can copy and paste chat gpt so it's not about understanding it's not about technical capabilities it's not about like know-how it's only about strategic position and incentives and google adds all the incentives to not 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 create something which is helpful let me ask a practical question here so i'm thinking about investing in search engine optimization for our cooking school but yeah. it would take about at least a year, maybe two years. And it's a constant and significant money. So what do you think? Should I do that? Or in two years, it will be completely useless to 
invest in link building and, and other search engine optimization techniques? I, I guess my answer won't be pro popular, uh, but it's kind of like align what Google is saying for like 20 years at least. So, but people have a hard time to understand it and accept it. It's almost like asking me, okay, I want to get in shape, what should I do? And, I, and my answer is just like work out, right? It's, uh, but it's not a sexy answer. And that's, that goes for SEO as well. Google is basically saying that you should focus on the user and not on what Google is doing. Because Google is basically chasing the user. And if you are chasing Google, that you're always lagging behind, right? But if you just like skip Google and you just focus on like, okay, how can I give the most value? How can I help the most, right? And if you think about that, in, even in a cooking school, it's like uh, not just like creating like uh, random SEO optimized tags, but like, okay, let's get all the different use cases I'm solving here, right? For example, I'm solving for HR people, for the HR department in big companies, like the need, I'm solving the need of, okay, they need a get, uh, getaway. They need something which has to be organized. And if you understand this, that you can, you're not just a cooking school. You can actually help them to organize better. You can provide, for example, a, a, an interface where they can vote on what time would fit the best for the whole team, right? So if you try to make their job easier, and if you try to make them successful, that's kind of like the way forward. And it's going to be useful in the future as well, because no matter what is the interface, no matter it's like, it's either really like ChatGPT, Google, what, it's, it doesn't matter because if you understand the problems you are solving and it, you make it extremely easy and you think through the whole process, like even before going to the cooking school and after, because it's like, even like collecting feedback, right? That's like, what went good? What went bad? What, so what did you learn? So it's like, even creating them like personalized feedback, it's extremely good and useful. I have a advice here that uh, I heard from Chase Diamond, who is a genius email marketing expert and, and in content marketing. And he, he was very successful on Twitter with more than 100,000 uh, followers. And the day Elon Musk announced that he is planning to buy Twitter, then he thought, shit, maybe something will change here very significantly. And the next day he started to build their LinkedIn, which is now 200,000 people. So me and, and Twitter changed. Uh, and most of the big influencers on Twitter say that their reach decreased by 10 to 15% since Elon Musk took over. So I guess uh, for a, small business like us would be advisable to explore other channels, right? Yeah, yeah sure. It's like, uh, first of all, own your channel and it's email, right? So if you have email and you have relationship with uh, HR people, with, with big companies, with recruitment companies or whatnot, if you have personal relationships, it's trans transcending any kind of medium. So it doesn't matter, like, uh, at the end of the day, you're going to use Twitter or or, or or LinkedIn or, or Google for that matter. So like having relationships, having a, your own email list is kind of like a must. And obviously diversify and test. And if there's a new channel like TikTok, mess around, right? But don't build every, don't put all the, all the eggs in one basket, right? So that's kind of like a, a good advice that, yeah, obviously if you have, don't give too much value or, uh, let's say you just like creating affiliate uh, articles. Yeah, most probably you're going to be that. Your, it, your, your project doesn't really have a good and bright future, to be honest. But if you're solving problems, like in your case, uh, you are solving the problem of, of people who are having fun, uh, organizing them into one place and whatnot, and organizing like, but uh, uh, someone is having a, some allergy or such, and if you can do that, and they don't have to be, uh, deal with it because you just provide like a link, okay, share this link with everyone. We're going to push them. If they are not like, uh, not filling it out, we're going to push them. So you can kind of like create a situation where you are kind of like a savior of, because normally it would be a big headache and you just like actually taking, taking off everything from their shoulders. And that's a good situation to be in. Okay, Victor, let's go back to Anthropic, our yeah, topic sure. today. Yeah, sure. So why, 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 why did I say that they are most probably one of the most underhyped 
a company out there because obviously if you go on, on Twitter, you see like uh, OpenAI is doing this, OpenAI is doing that, or Microsoft is doing this or that on Google. But Anthropic uh, is already out achieving everyone on the market because they have a model which is called Cloud and they have like a small one which is Cloud Instant, which is kind of like an analogy of ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo, and they also have Cloud Plus, which is kind of like a GPT-4-ish model, and they also have a 100K Cloud. And what does it mean? It it, it has a 100,000 token context window. And what does it mean? It means that actually you can feel and you can push one 120 pages into the prompt itself. So what does it mean? For example, for us, uh, if we have a podcast and we have a transcript, we, do, we cannot push the whole transcript in, into GPT-4 because it's even sometimes it's even longer than 8,000 tokens, which is like 10 pages. It can be more than that. So and we so have we have to be, up in, in six yeah. pages, six pieces, which is, which is really painful. Yeah, because it, yeah, it, and also like some context is missing there as well. So if you, it's, it's not just like recursively doing on smaller batches and then aggregating it. They are sometimes. At the first batch, there's information which is relevant for the last batch, but it's lost, right? Because it everything is 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 uh, processed individually in smaller pieces, so it's a pain in the fucking ass. Just like what, just like what what Whisper is doing is uh, OpenAI is doing with Whisper. You can obviously upload a, a a file, but it can be 20 megabytes, and it's a fucking pain in the ass because you have to ch- chunk it up, you have to process it individually, you have to concatenate it, and and so on. It's it's a pain in the ass. And what's insanely good with Cloud 100,000 tokens, it's actually can you can feed into it 120 pages. So we feed into the whole transcript which we created, and we can just like ask questions like, okay, suggest me five titles for this episode, right? And we can even use a few short examples, like, okay, here are good title, uh, podcast episode title examples. Here are five, and please, Regarding this uh, transcript, provide me five more. And it's insane. And you can use it to create LinkedIn posts. You can use it to create uh, show notes. And it's extremely good. And it's already available. So if you go to po.com, you subscribe, you get access to the 100,000 uh, model. Uh, obviously, it's limited. So not unlimited uh, amount of interactions are allowed. But you can get access, and we use it, and it's insane. And, and they so already they have API access. So if you want to build something with a one hundred thousand token model, you can, right? Yeah, right, but it's not public yet. So you have to kind kind of have to, it's, it's it's kind of like the like uh, what GPT four thirty two thousand token model is. Like you can apply to get GPT four, which has like the third of the hundred thousand. So so it has basically 40 pages. So there is a model, GPT-4 model, which can handle 40 pages already. But it's kind of like, yeah, it's beta listed. So you have to get access to it. So I, I have access to it, but it's like, it's not common. It's quite rare to to get access to to that model. So that's kind of like uh, intriguing that they already released it. So it's not kind of like uh, some vaporware bullshit a fake door test on their part is that actually you can use it. So you can go to poll.com, you pay $20 and you can use it and we use it and it's insane. Do you want to uh, provide us like a, because I, I know that you made some comparisons. Obviously I use it as well. So we kind of like use parallel GPT-4 and the cloud models. So both of us are using it, but I, 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 I guess you, you created some more structured way of compar- comparing GPT-4 to cloud and can you just share what, what did you find? Sure. Okay. So I wanted to understand when should you switch to cloud if you're already using ChatGPT, because it's our use case. And uh, in the past episodes, we talked about several use cases of ChatGPT, for example, uh, generating LinkedIn posts, tweets, or prompts for images. And I wanted to explore the Anthropics model cloud uh, on these dimensions. So first, uh, start with the context window uh, in the comparison. So currently, what is accessible is the 8,000 token window for uh, GPT-4. Which is basically the which, 10, 10 pages uh, in a GPT-4 case and include 100 token, 100,000, it's 120. So it's kind of like 10 times more, basically, what you can f- fit into now, into Claude. 
Yeah, so this 8,000 is very good for creative tasks. For example, coming up with names for our podcast that we did or these short tweets, even LinkedIn posts. And also having a gut prompt, which is basically doing a small research on the most important mental models and do an actual task. So this 8,000 uh, token window is great. But you mentioned if you want to summarize a podcast, then it becomes almost impossible. Even if you cut it in six parts and feed it into JGPT, the trolling context window will start to cut out the first parts. So it's not good for long, long documents at all. But with Claude 100,000 uh, 100, tokens, where I just pasted the transcript in, in, in Claude and I just I, I was able to ask several questions and I asked like 20 or 30 questions. What are the most viral parts? What are the most engaging parts? Uh, write, link, write me LinkedIn post. And it, and it didn't uh, forget the original prompt, which was still long. It's like 80, 85,000 characters, which is one, one and a half hour when we, when we speak. So it was very useful for this use case. In your experience, like because you mentioned like LinkedIn post or uh, using the gut prompt and, and these kind of things, how does it, the, because it, yeah, it's like quantity is not everything, right? So yeah, obviously it's good that you can fit more information into uh, Cloud 100K, but what is the um, quality wise? What's the difference between GPT-4 and, and, and Cloud 100K? Okay, I will go into the quality on different uh, uh, parts. First, uh, when I wanted to generate LinkedIn post, ChatGPT is very good with zero shot prompts. So I just said, please write me a LinkedIn post based on this short summary. Yeah. On the other hand, it was harder to get a good LinkedIn post with zero shot prompt from Claude. And even with a few shot prompts. So I provided two examples uh, to Claude and asked yeah. to please write a similar. And it was yeah. very, it was not that strict on following my instructions. Yeah, but what, what, what kind of like, if you had to put a number to it, so on a scale from one to 10, 10 is the perfect, like a masterful LinkedIn post, one is like basically garbage. What is GPT-4 compared to Claude 100K? I would say, okay, I, I would say other, on a, from an other perspective. So at least I, I think Claude needs two or three more uh, iterations of prompts. And even the end product is not that good that I'm satisfied at all. Yeah, so but, but maybe but I would say number? 60 to 60 to 70 percent. Okay, so, so six to seven is the maximum you can get out from Claude, and GPT four is like what's the number for that? Nine, ninety, ninety-five. Okay, so it's almost like perfect, right? Okay, that's that's that's, that's can that's can yeah that that can be. Okay, this is our baseline. It is it's not perfect as a good copywriter would write that, but yeah. you know, ChatGPT defined our baseline and for now. Yeah, sure. So it's kind of like, and you, you, I guess you can even chain things, right? So it's like you can do the pre-processing on large documents with Claude, right? Get a draft, like, which is cohesive, which is not perfect stylistically, right? So it's not something which you are satisfied with as a master marketer, but at least it's like, it's it's more cohesive or it, you, you could feed everything into one, one role, basically. And then you can basically use GPT-4 to fine tune it, right? So because then it's already condensed, it's already short, it's already selected. And once you have like the gist of the LinkedIn posts, which you can generate, then you can go one by one and fix them up with GPT-4. Does it make sense? Yeah, I think you are right. The unfair advantage comes when you can combine different AI. So for example, when you can combine ChatGPT and MidJourney, and when you can combine Cloud and ChatGPT, this is where uh, you can create some word class uh, text. Yeah, this is extremely important what you just uh, covered that if you know the upside and downside of these tools, right? Then you can get the most out of them. And it's, I, I, my, my biggest problem is that uh, people are too obsessed with one single solution, one single model, one single prompt, one single whatnot, right? And it's, it's, it doesn't make too much sense because if you, you understand your tools and you do, don't just have a hammer, but you have a tool set of different tools and you understand when to use them, you can get world-class results. And so the end goal, at least in our case, is not theoretical. It's very practical. We want to get shit done, right? We want to make money. We want to save time. We want to scale things. So we are dealing with business of AI, 
not the intellectual of AI. So in this case, uh, if you understand these tools and that's why we use them, we can we can get more value out of them. And that's what I urge the dear listeners to do as well, that please don't think that one just one tool will solve all your problems. It, it shouldn't. There are so many tools and that's why we are covering them. That's why we are doing these deep dives that you know the good, the bad, and the ugly of each of the tools which we have and you can use. Okay, next one, naming a podcast. So this is a short text and a creative one. And I think that this is a huge difference. I started with uh, instructions, several instructions, uh, and also a few short prompts. And the ChatGPT was way much better from the get-go. It was it used alliteration without asking them. It, the, the names were more catchy, but also Claude was very close. So, for example, for our podcast, it it mentioned disruptors daily, which is something ChatGPT mentioned in the past as well. But still, I feel and, and now it's it's just a subjective feeling that Claude wasn't that creative. I have an interesting experience. I'm going to share it with you. Okay, so it's okay. like two minutes. Good. Victor is diverging for two minutes. So again. <laughs> Yeah, again. So in, in 2021, end of 2021, GPT-3 was released and I was playing with it and I tried to copy my coach. So I basically fed into like example question answers, five of them. And then I asked my question and it provided meaningful answer, helping how to ease the pain of my uh, baby who has tummy ache. So that was the use case. And it worked wonderfully. It even could copy... Without like without any inst- specific instruction, it could copy like uh, double spaces at the end of each sentence. So it was nine out of ten, I would say. So it was almost perfect. It was really good. And then two years passed by, and all these models get fine tuned on what is a good answer. So if you're asking for an answer, what 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 is the human feedback on that? What what makes an answer, an answer a good answer? So giving advice, hedging the advice, and those kind of things like, okay, yeah, obviously this is why your tummy can uh, hurt and obviously see a doctor. So that's kind of like the structure of it. And what happened is like two years ago, these models, all the models, like GPT-3 and up to all the, all the models, they were like a, a SUV, they, they, you could like off-road with them, right? And in the last two years, they worked a lot on like putting uh, the whole, all the models on a rail. So basically, just keep them on a rail. What is meaningful? It's going to be faster. It's going to be safer. Generally, it's going to be better. But now, it's extremely hard to instruct them to follow the creative task, which is diverging from the, the common path. So in this case, in a coaching case, answer shouldn't be uh, giving ad- advice. It, it should be like uh, introspective. It should be more question-based and so on and so on. And now I have to be extremely explicit about that. Okay, please write double spaces after each sentence. Please ask follow-up questions. Please, and I have to define everything. And it's a pain in the ass. And the best I can get is seven out of 10. And even though these models are on general much better, right? It, it, it's much much more valuable, but now they are very narrow. So in a sense, they can le- get less creative because now answering has so much bias. And I guess with LinkedIn as well. So uh, I guess if you just ask for two years ago, if you provide LinkedIn uh, posts, they, which means that you just provide like five good examples. So these are five good examples of uh, LinkedIn posts. And please write me a new one based on like this information, two years ago, I guess it worked much better because it has le- had less bias about like what is the good, what is like a med- median, what is the median of the LinkedIn posts, right? Because now if you ask LinkedIn posts, it has very much, it uh, has a lot, lot of bias. If you ask for an answer, it is very biased, right? So it has a lot of bias about like the different modalities of the answers. And that's kind of like the trade-off which happened in the last two years. And that's, uh, that's something I just wanted to share uh, so if you're frustrated about that, uh, my current solution is be extremely explicit about what you need. And the other hack as well is just try to stay away, away from the biased expression. So in this case, try not to say even uh, LinkedIn post. So these are good text examples I need, right? So these are good examples. Write me a good, another good one. 
without mentioning that that LinkedIn. The same for Twitter. So not you are not saying like I need a tweet because it's very biased about like what is a, a me, me, median tweet, which is like I want, don't want to say shitty, but in a sense it's shitty. That is, if you have a specific goal, that in that sense it's shitty. So then just like write like okay, these are good texts I I need and please provide me one more uh, based on these criteria. Okay, let's go back to comparing ChatGPT and Claude. So next one is generating prompts for mid-journey to generate AI images. And what yeah. do you think, Victor? Which would be the better, ChatGPT or Claude? Or maybe the final verdict will be something else? I, I think it's GPT-4 because it's kind of like have stronger reasoning cap- capabilities. So I, my, my guess is that the 100K context window is not the same as the Claude Plus, which is kind of like in comparison with GPT-4. So the analogy is GPT-4 and Claude Plus, and GPT Instant and GPT 100K with ChatGPT 3.5. So I, I guess when we're comparing uh, the 100K Claude to GPT-4, it's not fair because it's almost like comparing 3.5 ChatGPT to, to GPT-4. Okay, Victor, I think the final answer will surprise you. So I will, uh, I will share you a few images. If you are uh, listening to this podcast, I will uh, describe what we are what we can see on the screen. But also you can click on disruptordigest.com and quickly uh, find this part in the video. So first I asked um, uh, Midjourney to generate Greek kitchens. And I just, just put imagine Greek kitchen, nothing else. And what we can see on the picture, there are four images of Greek kitchens with uh, see in the background and it's an inside view and uh, again another four pictures these are very similar they are not realistic but they are not painting so they are in between somewhere and I did it four times with the very same prompt just Greek kitchen and the results were very similar again I, I, I'm showing four pictures of Greek kitchens blue not realistic not painting and see in the background so basically the same and and one more of this and now I asked uh, uh, Claude with uh, with a previously mentioned prompt to, to generate an elaborative prompt uh, for this Greek kitchen. So, for example, imagine uh, uh, imagine a blue kitchen painted on canvas uh, from from a certain perspective, and so. And now we get again from for one of one of iteration, the images are very similar. Uh, uh, compared to the previous one, but now it's fully a painted one. So now the style is different. So why is it interesting? Because now we have a different style. So it's now, we we can test something. For example, think about if we want to create Facebook ads. Now this is something different. But uh, here comes the next one. And uh, this is uh, what, uh, again, Claude came up uh, with. And it said, um, create a a picture of four... uh, culturally diverse women uh, who are having fun in a in a cooking class and now it it was something different and and I'm glad that we live in a time when mid journey 5.1 is existing because these the faces that we can see are almost perfect realistic and when I st- when I tried to create faces in mid journey v3 it was very bad yeah, and the, the the neat thing what's happening here is like you used kind of like chaining as well. So you used either with GPT four or Claude to generate prompts for you, which you fed into Mid Journey, right? And uh, yes. I guess this talks to the strength of Mid Journey. I just want to focus on Claude and ChatGPT. Just one thing that now we we came up something very uh, different than before, which is a uh, uh, three women having fun and their uh, hair is blown. Uh, so it's like a very dynamic image. And also the next one, Claude come up with this. Okay, just, just, a... just, just, to, just to those who are listening here, it's like what you see on the screen previously, it was like the same, basically the same kitchen. It's like very Greek style with a scene in the background, very bluish, uh, it's a blue dominated scenes, right? And then what Claude did is like created a dynamic scene of people enjoying themselves. And then it also came up with, even more dynamism. So not just smiling, but also the hair is tossed in the air. So the, the, the shot is like, it would cost a lot of money. And I, I imagine that someone is 
if someone had to shoot this shot, it would take a lot of tries, a lot of time. And uh, it's insane that it's possible now to, to have this dynamic setting. And it's all always generated with Claude. It's, it, it's insane. Yeah, hiring the talent, booking the studio, uh, having yeah. studio lights, uh, multiple multiple people on the crew, and of course the photographer. I guess at least five or ten k in the minimum, maybe up to twenty, thirty k uh, a, a day for creating photos like this. Yeah. Okay, so the next one. Okay, this is something Claude come up with. These are very plain and boring photos of bread and a bucket of flowers on the table, which is not good for the purpose. But just want to show you that, that now creativity started to diverge. Yeah. And uh, okay, I did the, did the very same with ChatGPT. And now it came up with uh, uh, this picture, which is olive oils and tomatoes on a plate. And, uh, and some people are picking them. So again, it's a very different approach. On the next page, we can see Greek kitchens, but their style is very different because it's more of a orange and red um, type. And because ChatGPT was focusing on the ground, which is terracotta, which is a classic Mediterranean uh, yeah, flooring building material. Yes. So now, if you maybe if 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 you're an interior designer and you want to see and a different creative di directions of, of a kitchen, of a scene for a film or, or something like that, then now it's in different perspective. And the last two ones, again, uh, similar problem, but it's a, what you can see is a modern Greek kitchen uh, with more of a modern style. And, and it's, now it's, it's very photorealistic. And, and the last one is, again, a blue kitchen, uh, but it's, Again, focusing because ChatGPT um, included something about the floor. The picture is focusing on the floor, uh, so and and it's photorealistic and still blue, but it's very different from the previous one. Yeah, that's, so that's to make, make clear make clear the whole process for the listeners. You had a prompt, and the pro the original prompt was what? Greek kitchen. Okay, so that's what the original prompt. And then yes. you kind of like had two different flows. You used Claude, you also used Chat GP, uh, GPT-4, right? And what, what was the prompt there? So how did, you, how did you explore creatively and moved away from uh, just having a Greek kitchen? So we have a prompt which is created by Samson Vovals. And this is a long prompt uh, that starts with like this. I want, to, I want you to act as a prompt engineer. You will help me write prompts for an AI generator called Midjourney. And later it will be data that please define a camera lens. Please define a perspective, uh, color, color styles, color references, position elements, and so. So uh, basically you outsource the creative process to the language models like GPT and Claude. Yeah, so, so actually the, this prompt uh, was used uh, to kind of like generate, like from Greek kitchen, generate something which is more creative, right? And only this prompt was used. Yes. Yeah, this can be sh uh, shared in the show notes actually. And uh, it's part of also the God prompt plugin, which we have. So if you have a God prompt plugin in ChatGPT, so if you are a subscriber, you can use it. And what's happening, it realizes that you want to generate an image and it's kind of like instructing ChatGPT to use this prompt to generate better uh, prompts for mid-journey. Okay, so my impression about Claude and ChatGPT for this use case is that uh, you can get more if you combine them. So you so you make the same process on both, and you feed Midjourney uh, the prompt, the, the final prompts that was generated by ChatGPT and by Claude. And in my case, uh, my goal is to create very different uh, images so I can test them on Facebook, which, which will get a higher click-through rate. So I think combining them is the unfair advantage here. Again. Yeah, that 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 sounds awesome because once again, I just want to highlight highlight this that you had to have zero background basically here because you just had Greek kitchen, you copy pasted this prompt, but you don't even have to copy paste because it should just use the God prompt plugin. Then you just like write Greek kitchen, and it's generating for you like variations for mid journey. And you can copy the same prompt 
and using Claude. And it's, it's kind of like using a different cr uh, creative process, kind of like using a, another creative person. And once again, you get different results. Awesome. So in, in my mind, those pictures was 10 out of 10, each of them. So they were insane. And you get insane results without having zero background. And only you, only thing you know is like you want to have a Greek kitchen. So that's insane. That's, that's, that's I think, if you understand this, you are much further ahead than anyone in your in your field. Right. Okay. Just to final, uh, just to finish this comparison, just a few technical things that uh, I think uh, Claude uh, is a little bit faster, so you will get answers a little bit faster. But the general the speed is the same as GPT four and and Claude. Okay. So my impression was that Claude Plus is kind of like the same as GPT four in both terms of uh, quality. Is a little bit lagging behind but kind of like the same but on speed wise it's the same as gpt4 and claude instant and instant 100k those are similar in speed and quality to chat gpt 3.5 so yeah you in, in, in the instant 100k uh, model for claude you can fit in 100k tokens but it's it has lesser abilities than the Claude Plus model. That's similarly like GPT-4 and GPT-3.5 Turbo. It's like, yeah, Turbo is quicker, it's cheaper, but uh, I mean, it's much less capable on logical thinking than, than the GPT-4 model. Okay, besides these use cases, I also tried writing poems and fiction, but the, th but the overall impression is the same. So first one, Claude is not following instructions closely. And one more thing, Victor. Yeah, sure. So it's, it's kind of like the takeaway. So if you just like want to tr try to summarize what is Claude 100K good for, the name is even Claude Instant 100K. So that's kind of like the equivalent of ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo, but with a bigger uh, context window. So the similarity, if you use the gut prompt or try to use the gut prompt in ChatGPT 3.5, it won't follow it. It won't be as good with complex logical reasoning and instruction following. So that's the same for Claude 100K as well. So it's not that good uh, with gut prompt uh, thing, and it's not that good with uh, fiction writing or poem writing because complexity, when complexity increases, you should use or aim for better or bigger models like Claude Plus or GPT-4. So that's kind of like the big, big, big takeaway. Okay, so we talked about... Anthropics products. Let's have a big picture view of the company. Yeah, sure. Let me share my screen. I'm also going to describe for those who, who are just listening. So what you see is the business model canvas for Anthropic.com. As, as we discussed at the beginning, it was founded by AI researchers. So if you look at the key activities, R&D is very important. In the first one and a half years, actually, they only did research and development. And then they started to commercialize. And since then, the other very important uh, key activities, product market fit search in all the different industries. And if you look at the key resources they have, it's obviously 1.5 billion funding. And uh, also the, their 100K cloud model, but also ex open AI people. And uh, their CEO is VP, was VP of research uh, at OpenAI. So uh, these people have all the knowledge, all the know-how, all the proper uh, uh, frameworks to create something which is useful. And I guess the cloud 100K is, is, is a telltale of that, that they are the ones uh, the only ones which uh, who, who provide this, this kind of model already. And uh, the interesting thing is uh, they have key partners like Google. And Google was investing, but also they are partnering with Google to provide compute because Google is good with providing cloud services, right? But they also partnered with Zoom, for example. So Zoom Ventures invested money uh, just a few, few uh, months back. And Zoom is good actually for sales as well. Right. Actually, Zoom has a, a solution for providing communication for customer service agents, and they are going to integrate uh, anthropic models to, in one way, help the users to get answers, more relevant, faster, more personalized answers, and also have the customer service agents to be more productive. So that's, that's neat. And also put it there, I'm, I'm not sure about that, I just put it there that, uh, for example, a company like Scale.com which is aggregating the different AI providers and providing services to enterprise, 
is something is something where they can provide value as well. Like, okay, here's our model, and you can sell our model if someone is in need. So, uh, key proposition. So, what do they provide? On one hand, they provide safe models. They provide 100k pages of uh, 100k tokens. So basically, 120 pages of text. And Claude Next, what they are working on is 10 times better. It's going to be 10 times better than GPT-4. So that's kind of like what is the key value proposition. And who are they providing this? So who are the customer segments? It's education, entertainment, government, intelligence, community, legal, entrepreneurs. So basically, as I said, they're trying to find, find product market fit. And what kind of channels they use. They use Google Cloud, as I said. They use Zoom contract. Uh, contact center, which is kind of like the solution Zoom is providing for customer service agents. Uh, and mainly they communicate currently to API documents. Uh, their documents. So how, there's actually quite good documentation about the, how their uh, API works. And on, on the white sticky notes, I, I provide additional uh, channels I think they should use or could use or will use in the future most probably. So for example, one of the big problems is finding, for them as well, finding product market fit, but it's also the problem for the clients as well. So let's imagine you are you are having an enter enterprise company and you don't know how to integrate something. So having a playground examples, right? Or having a quiz where you answer questions about like, okay, what you are building, then you can get back examples of ad how others are using the tools, right? So helping people to figure out how to and what to integrate into, into their product as an AI tool could be extremely valuable. And also the how side, so how uh, Anthropic is helping developers could be YouTube ed education as well and integrating with tools, AI tools like Longchain and, and the similar tools. And also into no-code tools as well. So helping no-code tools providers to integrate, easily integrate uh, the Anthropic uh, model features so that's kind of like the big overview and also on the cost side there's a fixed cost of wages and a variable cost of compute and that's what we discussed already that can be extremely uh, expensive and on the revenue side it's very easy pay per use so as much as you use you pay for that and it's quite similarly price uh price to to open ai and what they don't have or at least i i I wasn't reading about that. Maybe they have it, but most probably they're going to have, have in the future. So that's why I put it on a white sticky note is the Foundry dedicated privacy instances. So just uh, I, I just talked to I just talked to a, a lawyer who's working for an international law, uh, law firm. And for example, they paid, I, I guess this, the pricing is starting at $800,000 per year. And then you can get dedicated instances. So in OpenAI's case, right? And why is it good? Because obviously it's privacy pre uh, preserving, they can use clients' data and so on and so on, which is paramount and, and, and a must have for a legal company. And, the f and this is what uh, OpenAI is calling Foundry. And this is the, the gist of it is basically dedicated privacy instances. So if they don't provide it, they will provide it most probably, or they should provide it because these big companies uh, can easily pay a uh, million dollar a year because it's it's nothing compared to the additional value it can bring or the additional capabilities it can uh, unlock. So this is kind of like the big overview of what is the strategic uh, business model canvas for the company. Great. Thank you, Victor. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, let's move on. So let, 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 let's get to the next uh, part. Like, okay, what, because we already discussed that they are looking for product market fit. And I guess the listeners want to know as well, like, okay, what can I use it now for, right? And we already uh, covered like a long form content generation, editing and translation. So just like generating a whole book or edit a long manuscript or uh, coherently translating whole books, training materials for enterprise as well. So what's, what's, we already discussed that uh, if you chunk up a big piece and you process it uh, by one by one, you kind of kind of lose the coherence between the pieces. And 
it, it's already working. You can already try it. It's quite good, but obviously it has limitations. Like uh, this 100K model is based on the instant uh, model class, which is fast, but less capable cognitively. Uh, it, ha- it can also be used for extended conversation role-playing. Uh, it's like almost like a, what? Victor, just Replicacy. one more thing. What do you think? Is it possible for a uh, cloud that we feed the most important, most interesting, wide or engaging parts of our first eight episodes and it will write a book for us? I like don't know. We have page to... book based. We, we have to try. I, I'm, I mean, the big, big uh, limitation currently is that we don't have API access only through pool.com. And it's neat that they have 100k context, but kind of like the li- the answer is limited. So if we ask for like the whole book, I guess it won't fill out the whole 100,000 token limits. So we should. Be- so so, so, so my, my currently our li- our real limitation in to the test is is just like we don't have API access. But as soon as we're gonna have API access, definitely that's sh- something we we're gonna try to just like try to generate as much as as possible and see what the output is going to look like. Okay. So, yeah, it's like what you also discussed, analyzing entire research papers, legal documents, summarizing the main points, extracting key details, or even in a coding uh, scenario, refactoring large pieces of software code, adding comments and documentation, writing unit tests. And I think that since... Cognitively, it's limited compared to the Cloud Plus model or, in a sense, to GPT-4. I think, like, generating, automatically generating documentation from code would be better suited than writing code itself. So, so code writing is quite complex compared to just, like, writing documentation about, like, okay, what, what's happening? What is this code a piece of code is doing? Because it's, it's quite sequential. It's quite, like, there is a code. It has to be explained. So... Uh, writing automatic documentation is something uh, which is possible now for big code base uh, code bases as well. Because if you think about that, there is a big code base, and you want to onboard a new developer, right? And someone has to write the, the documentation, right? And it can be outsourced to to these kind of models. And if you commit to a change, then you can update that documentation as well. So you can have an up to date documentation, which is kind of like unheard of so it's, it's almost impossible to do otherwise and now it's it's possible so that's something i'm, I'm extremely excited about and also the last last uh, part is um, educational applications so that's kind of like the same as we discussed with the book one that we have to have api access but if you have api access possible it's it's, it's going to be possible to generate entire course curriculums uh and and the neat thing is like we can feed into so much data. So it's like we can feed into uh, textbooks, we can summary of textbooks, summary of uh, guidelines, summaries of, I don't know. So we can feed in lots of information uh, and even relevant context as well. Like, okay, who are the st- uh, students who are generating this for? So this can be generated even student by student basis. So you can get your own specific curriculum and someone else is getting their specific curriculum and since it can have all the uh, long contacts that's something if which i'm excited about and i guess even if it's like not right now but in a year or maximum two it's going to be extremely good quality so even though now it's like limited with this instant model of of like the similar to chat gpt 3.5 turbo uh, the same thing with cloud instant even though it's limited cognitively, it's going to be better, and and uh, and this is something I'm. I think it's it's quite strong. Okay, what kind of businesses can disruptors build on top of a cloud? Okay, so let's let that, that's one of the favorite parts of mine to discuss business ideas, right? And give you give you some food uh, food for thought. So, what's the biggest problem with business ideas only? So, let's say give you an example. My big business idea is CV generator, which is helping job seekers to generate first drafts uh, of longer, more compelling resumes, which are tailored to the specific job opening, right? So that's kind of like the, like the idea. But what's what's the big problem? Well, what's, what, what is my biggest problem? Is that as a developer or entrepreneur, 
do you know what you should build or uh do you know when exactly will your product be delightful or can you use this description as a as a compass each day no obviously not because it's quite vague it's just like oh, okay this is the idea of 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 cv generator but that's that's my testy model uh i became up with the testy model uh it's actually solving this problem because the testy model for example in this case it's uh, a testimonial which actually following f- four different things first it's ai generated why because it's more relevant and more personalized second it's a short testimonial why because it's easy to relate to and also three it vividly illustrates the pain points being solved so people can understand what you are building for and fourth uh, it makes the benefits tangible so you know what is the exact results people should get from something so in this case like let's say the first was like uh, the idea was that like just cv generator let's compare it to a testing model in this case uh, a testing model could be i'm a computer science graduate and was struggling to create resume that stood out to tech companies uh, this tool took my basic information and transformed it into a detailed compelling resume that highlighted my coding projects and relevant coursework I started getting callbacks for interviews almost immediately. So if just like get this short uh, testimonial, testing model, you instantly know what you are building for, right? You want to get like basic information. The end goal, the KPI you are measuring is whether people are actually getting uh, uh, feedback for the companies and so on and so on. So this testing model is So it's like short. similar to getting the pains, the gains and the jobs of customers, but in a more easily understandable way, right? So it's like a yeah. testimonial, which with a human could say, uh, but if you are reading it as a developer, it's more easy to understand what is the target audience needs and what do they, what do they like, right? Yeah, and, and if I want to be meta, so I want to provide a testimonial on testimonial, then here is the hard truth. Bullshit personas doesn't sell. Real stories do. Testimonial that transformed abstract benefits into tangible testimonials about, about, about solving real pain points. It helps investors to see value, customers feel understood, and gives the team a meaningful goal. Testimonial is our daily reality check and our best sales pitch. So that's kind of like the, the meta of testimonial of testimonial. That, yeah, you understand that it's a compass for everyone. It's easier to convey, and that's something you can get out each day and it can guide you each day to provide value and, and provide uh, delight. So this CV generator idea, it's obviously, it's, it's yeah, this tech job resume writer, it's tangible, but it can also be academic CV. So all your research and abstract can be fed into it, right? It, it wasn't possible before because the context was limited or it can be an executive level resume creator. So if you are C-suit, you want to have an up-to-date profile, but you don't have time. Obviously, you can shill out a few, few hundred dollars to have everything you did fed into it and extremely personalized, up-to-date, strong CV, right? So uh, that's something, if you are intrigued about, you can go out and, 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 and build this tool. But let's move on. Another idea, social media management service. So let's give you a testing model, a quick one. I own a small Italian restaurant in the heart of the bustling city. We have amazing food, but I struggled to get word out on social media. Then I found this service. They started creating posts that captured the magic of our meals and the atmosphere of our place. Suddenly, we started getting more likes, shares, and most importantly, customers. So that's something you can go out and and create a social media management for uh, local restaurants. How is it better than ChatGPT? Uh, why is it better GPT-4 as an API? Why why cloud would be better in this case? Uh, I think it's just, for example, processing more information. So if you have already reviews, if you have already feedback, if you have already a book about like where people are writing feedback, you can feed everything into it, right? So if you want to create social media posts and you have existing content, which you said, testimonials, a website, social media posts in the past, and you can feed a lot of them. You don't have to select them, just feed, just put, just put, and it will generate 
new social media post, right? Yes, that's right. And but also like, like let's put a spin on it. So in the author promotion, so it promotes uh, self-published people uh, their books on social media. You can actually feed their book into it, right? So that's insane. It's like uh, if you have a, a niche, then uh, you can go for it, right? And, 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 and serve them. And also e-commerce store manager. So handles the social media presence for online stores selling niche products. Uh, so they can put a spin on it and basically do the social media management service in any niche. So let's move on. A- academic essay helper. So let's help students. Uh, a quick testimony for this. As an MBA student, I often had to research and write case studies. Each one required a deep dive into company histories, financials, and strategic decisions. It was overwhelming until I found this tool. It helped me to structure my research, organize my thoughts, and present compelling analysis. My case studies went from being a source of stress to a source of pride, and I received high praise from my professors for my in-depth analysis and clear presentations. And you may think that this is quite a niche, but I mean... A lot of MBA students are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, just to get this this education. So this may sound like extremely niche, but this is lucrative if you just focus on them. You can focus on legal, you can focus on medical, you can focus on tech, because these these people who are studying at university for these fields, they already invest a lot. They already, not just time, but they invest a lot of money to do it. So cohesively summarize several research papers wasn't be possible before. So let's move on. Uh, fiction co-author. So it's like basically suggesting edits, characters, plots, descriptions to helping flesh out uh, an overall story arc. Uh, for example, sci-fi, right? So that's extremely short testing model. I always dreamed of writing a fantasy novel, but struggled with creating a detailed word, word and plot. With the fantasy book assistant, I was able to flesh out my characters, plot, and word, turning my dream into reality. I've just published my first book. So yeah, this this is something, I guess it's like, uh, also you, you may think that it's extremely niche, right? Like, yeah, science fiction writing. But if you think about that, just one website, it's called nanoremo.org. Get, it's, it's, a, it's a non-profit. It's focusing on only fantasy writing. And they are doing 800,000 visitors per month. It's insane. These people who try to write fantasy, they pour their life into it. They pour so much time and money just to realize their dreams. And you can build a tool just for them if you're focusing on just just for them. And I guess it's worth like 20, uh, 10, 20, 30 bucks a month if it's, it's good and it's actually helping you move forward. But it can also be other like, not just... Uh, sci-fi novels but it can be a fantasy book assistant as well uh it can be romance novel collaborators so it basically can bring these to to other field as well right so let's move on legal tech company so a quick testing model as a small business owner legal jargon used to send shivers down my spine contract analysis service made it easy they turned complex contracts into a simple language that i could understand I felt more confident in my decisions and saved a fortune on legal fees. So this is something which we can be done easily. It can help also, and we can put a spin on it, like patent filling assistance, real estate law advisor for rental agreements and, and, and deeds and those kind of things. So these are also may consider it as niche, right? Because you think like, ah, no, not, 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 it's, it's just a very niche market. But if you think about that, rental market, it's huge. Like real estate market is huge and lots of money is exchanging hand. So yeah, th- this can be uh, revol- revolutionized as well. So let's let's move on. Give you another topic. AI blogger. Give you a quick testimonial. I run a blog on JavaScript libraries, but struggle to keep up with the rapid updates and developments. The JavaScript library blogger helped me to create in-depth, up-to-date content that my readers love. My blog traffic has tripled. It can be also a crypto blogger. It can be microbiology blogger. And what's changed with these tools is that actually you can feed into the whole documentation of new uh, new libraries, right? 
you can even feed into the code itself. So the, the possibility is really endless and whatever is picking your interest, you can dig deep and provide a tool which, uh, which is helpful, but also news reports. So if you, if you think, if you stay on this uh, train of thought that creating news reports, like a local community news reporter, right? So it's just a quick testimony model. As a local journalist, I was overwhelmed with the number of stories in my community that needed coverage. The local community news reporter helped me write comprehensive news reports quickly, allowing me to cover more stories and keep my community informed. So that's one, one, one again. It's like uh, lots of people think that like local community uh, news is, is something which is niche, but it's quite a big, big market uh, uh, all over the world. So that could be useful as well. Or product descriptions as well, uh, just like writing Kickstarter project descriptions, luxury real estate listing describer, describers uh, and those kind of things. Uh, it's, it's easy to put a spin on it and create these tools. Also just staying on the language and, and tutoring side. It's, um, let's say, a quick testimony again. I'm a business professional frequently traveling to Spain. I need to improve my Spanish, but traditional language courses were too general. The Spanish tutor for business professionals gave me specific language practice for my business meetings and negotiations. My confidence in doing business in Spain has greatly, greatly improved. So that's one again, it's like the big languages are outside English, uh, which can be targeted and, and niche down, like just, for example, Spanish for business uh, professionals. But it can be Mandarin tutor for travelers or French tutor for students as well. So if you're an entrepreneur, this is the best time to be alive. And the same goes off for STEM assistant. So it's like ma middle school math as assistant, high school physics helper, or college biology study, study aid. That's the same, same, same thing, basically. And if we go to the enterprise, so what we covered now is basically what entrepreneurs can take on. But what can enterprise do or what can be done for the enterprise as, as a client? So digital therapist platform. So I struggled. So that's the testimonial. I struggled with insomnia for years. This platform sleep therapy advisor helped me understand the root of my sleep issues and provided practical relaxation techniques. I'm finally getting full nights of sleep again. It can be spinned uh, to stress management as well or PTSD counselor. So basically providing mental aid for your uh, employees, one of the best ROI thing ever. We're going to get into what kind of uh, perks you can get if you work for Anthropic, but one of the best ones in my mind is they provide $500 a month for wellness. And they understand, so the company understands if you're in good spirit and health, then you are doing better job and better output. So, but also what we covered, code refactoring service, so legacy code modernizer, Python refactoring service, game code optimizer. This is something which is quite common. Even with a legacy code base, it's thousands of people writing some code in, in I don't know, a COBOL or Fortran, and it has to be rewritten. And with these kind of tools where the token window is big, it's finally possible. Uh, corporate training is something with, with cybersecurity, sales training course can be fine-tuned to each and every company because you can feed into the company, you can feed the sales script, and you can generate something which is specific for a company and you can sell, sell it to them. And you can also sell the service it, it, itself so people are going through the course uh, themselves. Market research analysis. This is something we also covered and we do as well. We do lots of research and what if now all the research can be fed into it and it can make cohesive summaries. Coding tutor as well. So like Swift tutor for iOS development, Python tutor for da data scientists, Re React native tutor for mobile app developers. So the possibility is really endless, I guess. And uh, uh, the final thing I just want to say uh, is that Zoom, as I said already, invested and they integrating them into the Zoom contact center. So this is not uh, out of reality, which we cover now. And uh, also Notion AI is built on top of anthropic models as well. So, and 
they also have a junior learning uh, platform, a company which is basically helping coaching students. And it's they're covering different subjects, math, uh, critical reading, and and those and and these kind of things. And it's already done, but it's quite general. So if you feel inspired, uh, I urge you to just like create something which is valuable for your niche. And you can niche down, like you can create a lot of value. Okay, and we also did a community around uh, Anthropic, and we found that that Twitter is very strong with hundred thousand followers. And when we and when they announced their most uh, recent. Uh, cloud model, then it reached more than 2 million people. So it's very strong. But also, but I didn't find any dedicated Facebook groups uh, who are focusing on cloud itself, while there are several fa- Facebook groups uh, fo- focusing on mid-journey and, and ChatGPT as well. I guess the main reason for that is it's already closed beta, the API access. So developers can't really access it now. The only way to access it is either way through po.com or through Slack. So you can add their Slack bot uh, and have a conversation, but that get kind of like niche. So it's uh, st- still, if you move on to the next, uh, the, the final part of this uh, structure to recruitment, and we look at what kind of people they are hiring, it's not surprising that they are a research uh, institution first and foremost. So they hiring a lot of researchers, uh, computer scientists and so on and so on. And uh, now finally it shows that they're working on productizing what they're building. So they are looking for product people as well. And so it's it's kind of like in the process of uh, gradually releasing what they build to the community. And they are the very first step basically now. So that's that may be the f- biggest reason why the community is not that strong. And it, it also says and shows that most probably if you are into uh, community building, if you are into developer edu- education, if you are into uh, solution engineering for clients, they're going to need it. So even though if they may not have all these positions open now, they're going to need it for sure. So, and what does it mean? It's, it's, that's kind of like one of my, my biggest pet, pet peeves. It's like, if you like coding and you want to, quickly understand this field, like solution engineering is one of the best field you can be in because your day-to-day job is basically talking to clients, solving their problems, seeing how they solve problems, seeing how they're struggling, what can be done and what can what is unlocked, and you're helping clients to basically create value. And it's kind of like the fast lane of learning how to apply AI to business, real business settings. So uh, as I said, uh, obviously, uh, this five hundred dollars per month for Vanas uh, st- stipends is is something uh, which is which I didn't uh, come across before. So I big kudos to them for that. Uh, but also they 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 cover the usual. Also they give equity, they sponsor a green card if you need it. So it's kind of like they have all the perks. Uh, others are pro- uh, providing as well. And I also found they are hiring recruiters. So it means they are growing fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they need operators as well. And uh, I didn't really see explicitly, but I guess they're going to need security uh, expertise as well. Uh, And as I said, more people with product expertise, UX marketing, psychology. What we already discussed with assembly AI is that they're focusing on onboarding people to the the API. So... Obviously, the Anthropic is an API first company as well. So they are going to need people who are dedicatedly optimizing the workflow for developers. And also, dog fooding is my middle name. <laughs> That's my pet peeve. And what is that, dog fooding, Victor? So, so, so dog, dog fooding again is like uh, if you walk the path yourself. So you are in this case specifically, it means if they require every everyone on the company to build something on top of their APIs and no matter the expertise. So it's not just engineers and researchers, but also managers, also customer service people. And everyone, every single person should build something on top of the API if they require that. So basically use their own product, what would it unlock? And that would be the single most impactful decision they could make because then 
every single issue is just bubbling up. If something is not working, it's not clear, uh, there, or there are not, no, not enough tutorials for beginners, it, it, it's going to bubble up. So all, all these issues are going to bubble up. And it's going to continuously bubble up. And the needs, like, okay, I try to use this, for example, for sci-fi uh, writing, right? And it's not good for that. And it turns out it's going to it, it, it's going to, going to turn out because somebody's trying to do that. So the research and development uh, is covered already, and to find a uh, good product market fit, and also providing an easy to onboard experience would be skyrocketed if they just like requiring dog fooding from every single person in the company. So that that would be the biggest, most impactful decision they could make. Okay, thank you very much, Victor, and thank you very much, Disruptors, for listening to us for this long time. You will find every important link and information in the show notes. Please go to disruptordigest.com. Victor, that's a wrap. Yeah, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening, and see you guys. Thank you. Bye.